quite the intro. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you for having me and, and being inside on this beautiful, sunny day in Minneapolis. I know that I'm the only person between you and potentially another drink, so I'll try to make this quick, but every time I timed myself last night giving this talk, it went over 25 minutes, so I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry in advance. Uh, hi, my name is Juan Carlos Pagan. Everyone tends to call me JC. It's a lot easier. Get the whole bullfighter thing out of the way. That is my great grandpa up top. Uh, and I'm the little dude on the bottom. I just really like this photo and I like that. We're sitting exactly the same way. Uh, I am from New York, but not this New York. I'm from this New York. Um, I grew up two hours north in a little town called LaGrangeville, um, and this is where I made bad paintings and listened to Radiohead, and I was an angsty teenager. That place right there, this little Google screenshot. When I got the email to, uh, to speak here, I, I began to panic. Uh, I, gained, I began to panic mostly because, turns out, I'm not an expert in anything at all. I watched the talks that were given in the past and they were really thoughtful and um, educational and they went really specifically in on one thing. And there are tons of people in this room and in this audience that can tell you about M-theory or Dwiggins or variable type much better and well, more suited than I can. So, um, but I am an expert in my own work, I think. When I started put, putting this all together, I started really questioning whether I'm an expert in my own work. I started getting very worried. I'm like, well, this is concerning because the work tends to be all over the fucking place. Uh, am I an expert in my own work? And I started to freak out and I called my friend Annika. I'm like, listen, we need to have dinner because I'm, I'm about to give a talk at TypeCon and I don't know what to talk about. Uh, and she was like, well, what's your narrative? And I was like, I don't really know what that means. She was like, what are the things that have interest you over your life? What is your experience visually? Why don't you try to put them into buckets? Maybe that can help. I'm like, buckets, that's a great idea. I'm gonna do a talk on love buckets, the things that I love. So this talk is called Love Buckets. Uh, and I'm gonna take you through. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna take you through four things that I love in hopes that we can maybe unearth why I make the weird stuff that I make, right? So, things I love. Things I love, number one. This guy was obsessed with magic eye. Um, who by show of hands knows what magic eye is? Most of you do, All awesome. For those of you who don't know what magic eye is, you would stare at this thing for an extended period of time and one of two things would happen. You would either, an image would either emerge like dolphins or seahorses, or you would get a blinding headache. Um, <laughs> sometimes both would happen, but a young version of me was absolutely obsessed with this. I couldn't get past the fact that my brain and my eyes were playing tricks on me. That that this seemingly innocuous image could transform into something different. Um, and every time I would go into bookstores, I'd grab the Magic Eye book. Every time I talked to my parents, I'm like, buy me Magic Eye books. For Christmas, I'm like, Magic Eye, nothing else. Just get me Magic Eye. So I stared at this for a very, very long time. Uh, and that naturally led to an obsession with Escher. So I was one of those high school kids who had Escher posters, um, and I was obsessed with M.T. Escher, and I think it was, um, I think it was fascinating the way he made me question reality, right? The way like mathematics was broken and like everything was, could be up, can be down, down can be up. Um, reality was changed, right? Um, and I extended that love to Escher all the way through, like way longer than it should have been, all the way through college. I did my undergraduate studies at Parsons School of Design uh, back when these two were together. <laughs> It was a beautiful time. Uh, <laughs> and then I did my postgraduate studies at the Type at Cooper program. Uh, Kara's here and, and Hannes is here. And uh, it was a really, it was, it was wonderful. And at that time, I'm like, yes, I'm a designer. I'm an illustrator. I'm a letterer. And most importantly, I'm a type person, right? I play with type. I manipulate typography. I love letter forms. Um, so thing I love, number two typography. Um, but specifically, I fell in love with the work of Herb LeBallon and Saul Bass and people who, who were able to tell multiple narratives um, through the manipulation of letter forms, right? I couldn't get over that you can tell multiple stories just by tweaking a couple of little, little letters and forms. The first time I saw this, my mind 
fucking exploded. I was like, this is so simple and so smart, and I want to make work just like this someday, right? Herb LeBallon became my hero, and I tried to make work like this, or, and I still try to make work like this to this day. Um, but at the time, I was making some very amateur-esque uh, like, typefaces. This was my first stab at typeface design, Malleable Grotesque, which was a type family that really tried to capture this idea of what happens to metal when it gets heated, the softness of metal. And it was more than just creating a rounded typeface, right? It was really living in those really small moments that can capture um, the, that singular moment where something goes from hard to actual liquid, just capturing that one moment. And seeing it through a type family was something that was a really educational experience for me. I took that and I brought it into my experience at Type at Cooper where I designed Micah. This was my first real crack at serious typeface design. And the and, the, and my inspirations are pretty evident, right? Like you have a lot of Dwiggins and Gerard Unger in here, uh, and I really wanted to make a hardworking typeface uh, that um, could be legible in editorial context, right? But at that time, my buddy Mike reached out to me, and he was like, hey, I have this really cool project. He's like, this little company uh, called Pinterest wants to do a rebranding. And at the time, they were using Bellow Script by Underwear, beautiful typeface, uh, and they wanted something custom. So we ended up making that. Um, so this is what they use for a really, really long time. But, you know, uh, Pinterest at the time was a pretty small company. Uh, they were under 10,000 users, and I was like, all right, this is my opportunity to do some fun stuff typographically. I'm going to do my Herb LeBallon thing if I can, uh, and I'm going to add a discretionary ligature to the ST, and I'm going to do some fun things in here that I can sneak into this small company, because who's going to see it? Nobody. Whatever. Um, so I did this. <laughs> and yeah, everyone tends to ask me, are you upset that they lost the interest part in the, in, in the Pinterest logo? And the truth is, I'm not. You know, Ben and Evan were pretty straightforward that they really wanted to put most of the equity into that. And that's really where we spent most of our time, really bringing the concept and the idea and the essence of the brand into that P, right? Turning the P into the map pin with that little gesture was really where um, we spent a good deal of our time, right? And the fact that they became such a successful company really was really exciting because I got to see my work for the first time ever on everything and everywhere, and it allowed me to get jobs like this which was another identity project for Joan. Uh, Joan is an advertising agency in New York City. They're ran by two women, Jamie and Lisa, and they named their agency Joan because of the, all the badass women by the name of Joan. Joan Rivers, Joan Jett, Joan of Arc, you can go down the list, uh, but only one of them yields a sword, Joan of Arc. And I'm like, guys, we kind of have to make the J look like a sword, right? And they were like, yeah. So again, this is me trying to do my Herb Blue Ballon thing, trying to get this idea infused in letter forms. And the rest of the characters are supportive of this singular character. But really, the idea is captured within one singular letter form. Uh, and it was really fun, because they, they bought right into it. Which brings me to thing I love number three. It was late in the game, but I got introduced to the work of Franco Grignani. Matteo, I know you're in the audience, I'm sorry for butchering that. Um, but his work really changed my perspective on everything. And I think his explorations with optical, with um, the, the optical exploration that he was doing really tapped into that part of my brain that loved Magic Eye and Escher. I was like, holy shit, I wanna make work just like this. Just by tweaking lines, I can change people's perspectives. So I started bringing that work into my lettering. I started trying to like, merge these ideas together. And at first, this formal study of bringing lettering and optical exploration was just kind of a, a formal experiment. But then something else started arising. Uh, another narrative started taking place where you started looking at the treatments of these letter forms and the optical experiments. And you started reading into the letter forms in a different way and the words in a different way. Um, and at first, it was the background and the, and the word, and then ultimately the merger of the two, bringing the backgrounds and the type form together to, to make one singular image, right? And you know what happens. Once you start doing enough of this work, people, clients start asking you to do this work, which is exciting. So 
Variety magazine reached out. I was able to do some work like this for them. Um, Print magazine asked me to do the cover for their 20 under 30 issue. Uh, and this had another element of difficulty because the numbers themselves, which were exciting to create, needed to be divisible by five. It needed to be divisible by five because they wanted to showcase all the winners at once on the cover and within the pages of the magazine. So it acted like little windows into the work. Uh, most recently, I was asked to do the cover for the New York Times um, 50 Years of Pride. So 50 years ago in New York City, the Stonewall Riots, for those of you that don't know, really sparked a revolution within the LGBTQ community, which permeates today, right? A lot of the organizations came out of this riot that happened at Stonewall Inn, which is a bar on Christopher Street in New York City. So I went to Christopher Street and I'm standing there and I'm looking at the floor and it's kind of incredible. They, they took the street signs and they put the pride colors in between um, the street signs. And I, I was like, well, this is kind of beautiful and amazing. That became the launch pad for the 50 years of pride cover that we ended up making. Instead of separating the colors, what we did was turn all the colors into a gradient because the movement has grown since then, right? It's more inclusive and involves a lot more communities, um, both of color but also trans communities now. So the, the, the full gradient seemed to make more sense. But we still kept that idea of the, the street signs because the riot poured from the bar into the streets of New York City. Right. And I realized if, you, if I was able to draw the letter forms on an isometric grid, that you can bring the letter forms closer together to reinforce this idea of, of like coming together in community. So that's the wireframe on the left and the, the, the poster that we ended up making on the right. Abelor, how many of you are whiskey drinkers here? <laughs> Seems like it, yeah, all right. So if you're not a whiskey drinker, Here's one little insight. The water source is super important to making great whiskey. And they happen to be one of my clients, and they're, they are from Scotland, and they're, they claim their water source is the best water source on the planet. Uh, and they do make a beautiful spear. Abelor is fantastic. But they want to commemorate their water source. So they asked me to do custom um, numbers as if they were rising out of this water source that they had in Scotland. So we ended up doing the 18, the 12, and then ultimately the 16, right? Again, it's experimenting with these optical tricks. And at the time, I was playing around with not only digital optical tricks, but like how glass and water can just analogly, like optically mess around with stuff. And everyone's been there, right? Like if you've been to a, a restaurant and you had a glass of water and you put your hand behind it, it like manipulates it. So I took that idea and I sold it to my gin company, this gin company that I was working with. They wanted to do an out of home campaign um, to kind of showcase their gin. And I'm like, well, we can take words with gin in it and then shoot it through the bottle and distort the letter forms. And we chose words in this case, like imagine, words with the gin in it. Imagine, begin, Oregon, or, or I'm sorry, origin. But this was uh, really done for the most part through analog manipulation, just using the gin in the bottle itself to transform the typography. A lot of like Photoshop work in the end, but those manipulations are happening in camera. The ADC, I have a really wonderful relationship with the ADC and after I won Young Guns, they have this great tradition where a former Young Gun gets to reinterpret the, the award after they've won. They asked me if I would reinterpret the Young Guns cube. And we were staring at their logo and like, well, maybe there's an opportunity here to build letter forms out of the circular nature of their logo. And that's exactly what we did. We did this sort of like Lance Wyman-esque um, typographic treatment. So it's kind of like Inception ADC. You have the ADC logo and it says ADC, which then wrapped this acrylic cube uh, and we laser cut it. Uh, so this video will explain how we kind of got it done.
Yeah, so it was tricky. The, the hard part there was lining up each side of the cube so um, you didn't have a break. It was a seamless, it's a seamless piece of art that wraps this acrylic cube. Which brings me to thing I love number four, last but not least. Like most of us, I love typography on walls, on things that I can touch, right? Like whether it's a mural or carved into a wall, I'm obsessed with it. So much so that I collect doorknobs. I do, this is my, some, some doorknobs from my doorknob collection. So side note, if anyone has a doorknob hookup in Minneapolis, give me a shout. Um, and I'm, I'm obsessed with things that I can collect that have typography on it. Uh, so I got, so, which was really fortunate because I got a, a really great project presented to me. Kevin Cantrell and myself were able to um, create the trophy for Nike's Home Run King. So every year Nike gives a trophy to their Home Run King. And uh, I guess it's like a Home Run Derby that they have. And they wanted something that felt fast, that felt uh, really like beautiful and felt like stately. And I started off doing this and Nike quickly put the kibosh on that. They're like, nope, start over. So I went back and I drew this and I sent that over to Kevin and, and Kevin and I were like, I think this is a good place to start from. We can build off of this. And Nike felt like we could too. This italicized black letter had the speed, it had the premiumness and we can build off of it. And build off of it, we, we did. We ended up creating this nonsense. Um, yeah, it was a, this was really a fun process because me and Kevin treated this whole experience kind of like um, uh, improv where you just say yes and continue. So I would, I would wake up with files, add artwork to it, send it to Kevin, he's in Utah, he would add stuff to it, send it back to me, I would add, and we would just keep adding stuff and we ended up with the craziest file, um, which was really fun. We never said no and Nike didn't say no, so it was like, let's just keep adding shit and then see what happens. Um, so this is what we did and luck we left the hard work to Big Secret, which took our artwork and they manipulated it and made it um, work on an actual, like laser cut on an actual bat. This is a famous photo um, from 1958. It's called The Greatest Day in Jazz. Um, it was taken in Harlem. I live in Harlem. Harlem has a rich music history, and I have a friend who owns a music studio in Harlem. And then he showed me this photo, which is The Greatest Day in Hip Hop, also taken in Harlem in 2001. And I'm like, whoa, this is incredible. Like, he's in touch with like, both of these incredible like, movements. He makes music in Harlem, and he asked me to do. Uh, a mural in his, uh, in his recording studio. And I'm coming off of the Nike bat, so I'm thinking about black letters. But instead of doing an italic black letter, I'm like, maybe I can do a back slanted black letter. That's kind of interesting. And it kind of felt oddly appropriate. It felt like some like street art that you would see in my neighborhood. And then if I add, by adding the Victorian flourish to it, it really br brought a premiumness to this. So I created that, which I then ended up painting on his wall. And last but not least, the art director club was happy with the first cube, so they came back. They're like, hey, you guys, do you want to do it? Do you want to reinterpret our Young Guns cube, cube again? And I was like, yes, under one condition. We create an award that levitates. Uh, and they were like, uh, okay, sure. <laughs> because we gave a, uh, me and my studio gave a good deal of thought around like, the purpose of an award, right? You get it, and it's wonderful, and it sits on your shelf, and it reminds you of the hard work that you did uh, up until that point. But what if we can create an, an, an award that not only reminds you of the great work you did, but kind of tells you that you can stretch beyond what you, you can do and, and, and to push beyond yourself and what's conceivable. So we created the whole identity system around this idea of sort of lava lamps and, um, uh, and camo, like, like emerging but also levitating. Um, so this was the, I, the system. But really the winner, the key thing here is the award, and this video will demonstrate how we got it to levitate.
I get this question a lot, uh, who am I and, and what I do? I'm, I'm Gov. I work at Creolab. When Sunday afternoon approached us to make a floating award, uh, my, my exact first thought was, this is going to be awesome. We've never done a floating award before. Uh, the main challenge was technical. We had to put all this technology inside, close it up, seal it in a way that you wouldn't see any seams, and that it was just a floating award in midair. Sometimes I come into the office early mornings and we have this array of floating objects that still, and it gives this eerie feeling because you see something that shouldn't be happening, you see this object that is floating. That's a, that's a really awesome feeling. We make things float because we can and because it's a lot of fun to do. Each year, the Young Guns Award changes. This year's theme is Elevate. In fact, each entrant must elevate their own work in order to stand out. Each one of the 30 cubes were handcrafted from start to finish which reflects the level of craft it takes to win a Young Guns Award. We wanted the award itself to embody this idea of elevation. So we created an award that actually levitates. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, when I look at my body of work, uh, the truth is it, it is all over the place. Um, but it does capture, in a way, my narrative, these things that I'm fascinated by and have been embedded in my life for the past, like, since I was a kid, right? Magic Eye was something I, I, I stumbled upon when I was maybe five or six, and I still think about it to this day. And I'd imagine that's going to continue to change as I adopt new interests, as I stumble across new things that I'm fascinated by. I'm going to roll that into my work. And the truth is, I'm, I'm really just trying to blend these things that I'm fascinated by. I'm trying to push conceptual typography and, and optical uh, work. And, 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 and most of the time, it doesn't work, but sometimes it does. And that's really uh, a, a magical moment, and that's what I like to share. That's what I did share. You didn't see all the failures, which is 99% of the work that I make, right? Um, so type is going to continue to be at the core of a lot of that work, I, I'd imagine so. And I'm just thankful that you guys listened to this. So cheers. I made it on time. <laughs>